Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and joining us this evening. Uh, we're having a webinar about the Curtains Warbler tonight, and we're so excited to have you join us to learn more about this endangered species success story from our own Jim Bill, Jim Bull. Uh, my name is Sarah Halson, and I'm the program coordinator for Detroit Audubon, an organization dedicated to fostering the appreciation and conservation of birds and the environment that we share. We could not do the work we do without our funders and members, so I wanted to thank those of you who are on with us tonight who are members and are supporting projects like these. Some quick Zoom housekeeping before I introduce our speaker. You are able to control your video and microphone in the bottom left of your screen, so we ask you keep yourself muted so that we don't receive feedback from your microphones. You can open the chat box by clicking on the chat button on the bottom of your screen and introduce yourself there if you haven't already. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation, so please add any questions you might have into the chat and we will get to them in the last portion of the presentation. And if you have any further questions, please reach out to me. You can private message me and I'll try to do my best to assist you. And now I'd like to introduce Jim Bull, past president and active board member of Detroit Audubon. Jim has a long and deep association with the Kirtland's Warbler. His father helped coordinate the first census. He did research on and led tours to see the bird for the US Forest Service, was Detroit Audubon's representative to the Kirtland's Warbler recovery team, is the longest serving census volunteer, co-chaired the campaign to make this species our state bird, and was appointed and still serves on the board of the Kirtland's Warbler Alliance. Thank you and welcome, Jim. Thank you, Sarah. So I call this Kirtland's Warbler Perseverance uh, an endangered species success story. The warbler, the bird itself, has persevered uh, almost when extinct. It became pretty precarious, uh, very low level at one point, but has come back tremendously. But there's also perseverance, as you'll see, of uh, just a whole host of people that really cared about this bird and the jack pine ecosystem and helped bring it back. So with that, hmm, is this not working? There we go. So here it is, the Kirtland's Warbler, except the Faga Kirtlandy, which I had to really get used to because for years until just recently, it was Dentroika Kirtlandy, but they changed the genus. This is a photo by Detroit Audubon volunteer Sharon Cordy and it is a male, and the way you can tell a male is it has a darker gray, sometimes a kind of a bluish tint to it, back and head, a very bright yellow breast with dark streaking on the sides, and then the males only have this black mask, or technically it's called the lowers, the area between the beak and the eye and then it's got this broken very bright white eye ring so that's how you tell a male and this is also by sharon cordy took it on our memorial day camp out several years ago and here's the female much lighter gray back still has a broken white eye ring but pretty light and almost indistinct from a distance very light yellow breast with lighter speckling. Now this one on the left probably is a first year bird because they, uh, the adults usually only have the speckling on the sides and uh, this could be uh, you know, left over from the juvenile plumage, the speckling. When was the Kirtland's Warbler discovered? Well, I have to go to, into prehistory because I'm sure that as loud and melodic as the Kirtland's Warbler song. And the fact that we know that Native Americans extensively used the area that it inhabits in Northern Michigan, the Jack Pine Plains. And we think even uh, did some of their own management to do con bring control fires to that area. They must have known the Kirtlands, but I have been trying to uh, through some Native American friends, see if I can find elders who might have some knowledge of what the name might be in Native, 
in one of the Native American tongues, probably Chippewa or, or Ottawa in this area. So again, like I say, that we think that uh, they may have intentionally helped. I mean, fires were a big part of this area anyway, but uh, there are some evidence that they helped it along. And why would they do that? Well, here's, uh, well, because after a fire, you get lots of uh, ground vegetation, including lots of blueberries. It really um, stimulates blueberries to come back. And that was a, a prized uh, commodity for Native Americans and um, for lots of wildlife too. And the open areas that were created by the fire uh, were very much uh, preferred by deer and wild turkey and other game that Native Americans would have uh, come here to hunt. We, you know, the dry jack pine plains were not a place that uh, Native Americans stayed very long. They didn't have encampments here that we know, uh, but they did use it for uh, hunting and for gathering food. The discovery in Anglo history goes back to 1851, May 13th, when Charles Pease, the son-in-law of Dr. Jared Potter Kirtland, found a bird on his uh, father-in-law's farm just uh, west of Cleveland that he didn't know, he didn't know what it was. And the standard way to study birds at that time, not a way we would want to do that now, but uh, he shot the bird and he brought the specimen to his father-in-law, Dr. Kirtland. And Dr. Kirtland was a you know, very seasoned naturalist. He wrote Birds of Ohio and uh, he, he would have known any bird that was described, but it was a new bird to him. He did not know what it was. So he preserved it and he sent it to his friend, Spencer Baird at the Smithsonian who did further research and found it was a new species. And one of the perks of discovering a new species is you get to name it. And he named it for his friend, Dr. Kirtland. Dr. Kirtland was a medical doctor. He helped found the Western Reserve Medical School, uh, University Medical School, which uh, is home of the Cleveland Clinic. He helped found the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Again, he was an eminent naturalist, wrote Birds of Ohio. And another important thing he says is he was an abolitionist because there is a discussion right now, in fact, a meeting that's coming up very shortly yet this month of the uh, AOU, who, the American Ornithologist Union, that sets the, um, the official common names for all the birds, is they are very seriously considering renaming some of the birds that are named for Confederate soldiers or uh, slave traders and things like that. So uh, we think that uh, Dr. Kirtland, uh, maybe the Kirtland will, will stay the Kirtland Warbler as uh, we've got good creds with Dr. Kirtland. Dr. Kirtland also uh, has a couple other species named for him. The Kirtland's water snake, which is also endangered and is uh, found in Ohio and Michigan and some of the other Great Lakes states. But it, I have never seen one, but uh, really would love to because it's got this striking red belly that is pretty amazing. And then another snake doesn't have his name in the common name, but in the scientific name, Thelotornis kirtlandii is a forest twig snake, which is found in Central Africa. A little drama, there's another ornithologist, Samuel Cabot, that actually found the first Kirtland's Warbler. He found it in 1841. It, he actually was on a ship on his way to Yucatan going through the Caribbean, somewhere near the Bahamas, and a little bird landed on the ship. 
And again, the way that they dealt with studying birds at the time, he, uh, he shot the bird and uh, made a skin out of it, but because he didn't know what it was, but it got mixed in with all the skins. It had a date and location label, so he knew it was, you know, captured in, it was collected in the Caribbean. But he had so many birds that he brought back from Yucatan to identify and catalog that it wasn't until 1865 when he finally got to that specimen. And of course, by then it had been named 14 years before. So if he had been a little quicker going through his specimens, we might have been looking at they're talking about Cabot's warbler. The discovery of the wintering grounds occurred on January 9th, 1879. That was when the first one was found on land in the Bahamas. And by 1879, excuse me, there were 71 more records. And in recent years, when you know, Cuba was uh, opening up more, uh, there were um, a few specimens found on the island of Cuba as well. Now remember that the Kirtland's warbler was first described from a specimen in migration near Cleveland, Ohio in 1851. There was a lot of speculation in the literature. If you go to the scientific literature in the different journals, that was a hot topic people were debating where the breeding grounds of the Kirtland's Warbler would be found. And interesting to read. But that mystery was solved in June 1903 when two ornithologists, E.H. Uh, e. Frothingham and T.G. Gale, were fly fishing on the Asabo River. And I understand it was at the end of the day when they went to find a campsite on land that they encountered a bird and it was singing and they didn't know what it was. So again, they collected one and brought it back to Ann Arbor. So they were at the University of Michigan and they gave it to Norman Wood who wrote Birds of Michigan and was known as the top ornithologist in Michigan and uh, the one who was in charge of bird records. Uh, and he immediately recognized it as a Kirtland's warbler and he immediately set out to go up north and using the directions from these other two ornithologists, he, after you know, some tribulation and a lot of uh, turn around, he even wound up having to take a boat and a stagecoach, but he finally found the first nest of the species. And there is on private land, that site, I've been to it, and there's a marker that's been put there on a rock. And there is a photo, I could not lay my hands on it, but I've seen the photo of uh, representatives from Detroit Audubon, Michigan Audubon, and Pontiac Audubon around that photo when it was, I mean, around that plaque when it was dedicated. Uh, again, the way that they dealt with studying uh, birds was collecting them, and he did collect what's called the nest set. So. Uh, the complete set, the male, female, and the, the nest and the young are now preserved at the University of Michigan Museum. You know, I'm not going to go through all this history since uh, Sarah went through it, but I will just point out this. We always took a pilgrimage to see the Kirtland's warbler every year. Uh, my dad, when he worked for the Conservation Department in Roscommon, he was known as the person you went to if you wanted to see a Kirtlands. He would take you out to see a Kirtlands. And in 1963, Dad took me up for the dedication of the first U.S. Forest Service area dedicated to Kirtlands Warbler Management. And here you see the sign that was erected at that time. And you see Roger Tory Peterson who came up uh, to help formally dedicate that area. And that was one of the two times I got to meet him. And you see Pontiac Audubon listed as supporting it in Michigan Audubon, and there's Detroit Audubon. By the way, this sign no longer exists, and um, I'll tell you why later. I also did field research on the cowbird related to the Kirtlands, and these pictures are from um, that summer in my junior year of college at Adrian College, where I 
uh, supervising the Cowbird Research. We called it Cowbird Research Delight Incorporated. And here was the office inside of the tent where I typed up my weekly reports. And Jordan Audubon has been involved with the Kirtland's Warbler supporting uh, conservation of the Kirtland's Warbler and uh, management for the Kirtland's Warbler since the beginning. And we have had an annual pilgrimage on Detroit Audubon to see the Kirtlands uh, as part of our Memorial Day camp out until our, we lost the camp was sold two years ago. But up until then we were going every year and this is one of the most recent trips. And this is Kim Piccolo, who is the district manager, district biologist in the Mayo district of the U.S. Forest Service and is probably the U.S. Forest Service biologist most involved with the Kirtlands. So I love Oz Warbach, who used to do, a, he was a wildlife biologist, but also an artist. He did a centerfold in Michigan Natural Resources magazine while it was still being published. It was a cartoon, two pages, and he packed more information about an ecological concept or a species than you could imagine. And just, they were just fun and enjoyable uh, way to get information. This is from some time ago, and you see this was the range of the Kirtlands. It's much bigger now in the northern lower peninsula and in the upper peninsula and some in Wisconsin and in Ontario. And its habitat is created by fire. We'll get more into that later. And so here you've got uh, the Kirtland's Warbler scolding Smokey the Bear for shrinking its habitat. And what's the habitat? It is, you're gonna hear different figures, but my experience is about four to 15 foot jack pine is ideal. Uh, they will sometimes stick around till they're about 18 feet tall sometimes even 20, I suppose, but that's getting really um, into a, an area, they're not preferred. And there'd be much, many fewer birds at that time. They nest on the ground, sometimes uh, underneath the trees, but usually more in an opening in between and usually hidden by blueberries or other ground vegetation. Here is a Kirtland's Warbler nest with young. Here's what the eggs look like and a cream colored with kind of a light reddish splotching. And here's a male that is feeding the young. And these are probably sedges, not grasses around here. It's a pretty striking bird. This one is in hand because it was being banded. And you can see these are all males here. I'm gonna get an idea of the size of it from the relationship to the hand. Some key researchers are Dr. Jocelyn Van Tyne, who was ornithologist at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He did extensive work on the, the Kirtlands, the first person to probably really study the Kirtlands in depth. He was uh, planning to write a book about the Kirtlands, but he died before that could happen. Uh, so his assistant, Harold Mayfield, wound up writing it in Mayfield. Uh, would take time off from work in the summers and spring to help me to help Van Tyne. But his full-time job was, I believe, uh, personnel director at Owens Corning in Toledo. By the way, my dad also, um, Van Tyne asked him to be an assistant, but he just didn't feel that uh, it, would be, it would have been a come down in pay and uh, benefits. So he didn't feel he could do that because I guess it was right about the time I was born and felt he needed the, the bigger salary and uh, the benefits. Fern Dockham we'll talk about later. Uh, by the way, this, here's the book that Mayfield wrote. And it turned out that he thought there'd be extensive notes left, but apparently uh, much about the book was just in Van Tyne's head. It was not written down, at least not that uh, Mayfield or it, and Tyne's wife could find. Dr. Nicholas Cuthbert we'll talk about. He identified and came up with a solution to a serious problem that was impinging on the Kirtland's population. Dr. Larry Walkinshaw was just a gentle soul. I just loved him. Uh, he was a dentist, but 
he used all his spare time to study the Kirtland's Warbler, but he also studied sandhill cranes. He wrote a book on sandhill cranes of Michigan. He wrote a book on cranes of the world, and he also uh, did extensive research on chipping sparrows. So he wrote the second book on the Kirtlands. I had a nest when I worked for the Forest Service. Uh, it was a late nest in red pine. So anyway, he came over to ban the chicks. And I remember he reached down and he, he picked up the female and kind of set her on a branch. She kind of ruffled her feathers a little bit and he was talking to her and trying to soothe her. And he then picked up the young and he gave them to my girlfriend at the time. And she held them and gave them to him one by one to band and he gave them to me to hold until he was all done. He put them all back in the nest and then he reached up and uh, kind of picked her up and put her back on the nest. So it was pretty neat. John Probst was a regional a researcher from the Forest Service Regional Office in Milwaukee that did uh, some extensive research on the Kirtlands. Carol Bassetti, who you see here, did her PhD. She was from Ohio State and she probably did one of the most comprehensive studies of the Kirtlands. Uh, we'll talk about that a little more. Chow Ming at the University of Michigan did his master's degree on habitat work with my professor, Bert Barnes, forest ecology professor. We'll talk more about that. Turned out to be very important. Dave Ewart with the Nature Conservancy in Michigan, pioneered uh, helping get research started in the Bahamas and then connecting the Bahamas to the US uh, research efforts. Bill Urban was my boss in the Forest Service. He was the wildlife biologist for the whole uh, here on Manistee National Forest. Phil Huber, who was the Mayo District biologist before Kim took over, he's now in Bill's old position. Jerry Weinrig, who is now retired from the DNR, and Mike DeCapita, who was the chief person with the Fish and Wildlife Service, was now retired. And Nathan Cooper is with the Smithsonian, and he's doing some really cutting edge research. He's the current researcher that's probably doing the most. Some Key writers are Bill Rapai. He wrote the third book on the Kirtlands uh, about its recovery. He is president of Gross Point Audubon and also executive director of the Kirtlands Water Alliance. And he formerly worked for the Free Press as a reporter. And Amy Hansen wrote a children's book. Well, now I'm going to stop this share and go to show you a 16 minute video that gives. I'm sorry, folks, my computer crashed. <laughs> All right, so hopefully this is good. I don't know. Hopefully it will go. So we'll see. So um, the first census was done in 1951, and my dad, Wilbur Bull, helped along with Jocelyn Van Tyne to get that census started, and Harold Mayfield. Uh, my dad talked with Roger Tory Peterson at the Audubon Camp of Maine about this uh, during breaks and in the evening uh, about this idea of taking a census of the Kirtlands. Uh, Peterson was really interested in uh, talking to dad about that when he found out that he knew all about the Kirtlands and lived in Roscommon and worked for the DNR and you know, taking people out to see the Kirtlands. Anyway, at, at the end of his time at the Audubon Camp of Maine, he inscribed Dad's field guide to Wilbur Bull, guardian of the Kirtlands. That was my dad there. So the first census was taken in 1951. And the way that they did it, from what my dad described, is they didn't have that many people to do the census. So each person had their own routes. They just did on their own. And they would go through a mile section, and most of the territory up north is delineated, delineated into mile sections, a lot of times with roads around them. But they would walk in an S shape through the sections, and then they would note with a male symbol when they heard the male singing. Because you can hear that in the 
video, the song is very loud and melodic. A lot of warblers are just, you know, buzzy songs and not very loud, but uh, the Kirtlands is very loud and it also will sing upon a perch, you know, for five, 10 minutes sometimes. So they would go through in an S shape and they would uh, write down where they heard the Kirtland singing. And the first census results, they had 432 singing males. And you can roughly double that to get an estimate of the total breeding population because each male would have a female. Except, and here's the Vern Dockham story. When I was working for the Forest Service, one of my first tours was with, uh, included a reporter from the Bay City Times. She had covered the Kirtlands for years and she said um, on our way back, she was talking to me and she told me that she had interviewed Vern Dockham, who I hadn't heard of at that point, and said that his dining room table was all piled up with Kirtland's warbler stuff and he had to clear a place for her to put her notebook so she could write notes during their interview. And he said he was waxing on about the Kirtland saying what a great family bird it was, you know, that the male and female both uh, helped at the nest. She said, of course there was that one. But being a good reporter, she said, what do you mean that one? He said, well, there was Mr. So-and-so. And I don't remember the exact name, but he had names for them all. He said, Mr. So-and-so had a hen in section three and another one down in section 12. And he looked up and he saw that she was writing this down. He said, wait a minute, you can't put that in the paper. You don't want anything negative written about the morals of his Kirtland's warbler. But remember I told you about Carol Bassetti? She, in her studies, found that about 10 to 12% of the males are not mated. And about that same number of males have more than one female, two females. Anyway, they decided to do the census every 10 years. And in 1961, they counted again and they had 502 singing males. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, it was a, a nice little increase. But then the shocker came in 1971 when they did the census. They had only 201 singing males. And Audubon Magazine that summer ran an article, the title of which was Panic in the Pines. They didn't know why this had happened. They didn't know whether it was a steady decline or whether there was some catastrophe that happened um, in those 10 years. I can tell you it was listed as an endangered species, one of the first under the Endangered Species Act of 1973. A recovery team was formed of agency people and university people. That was what I was they tried out about a representative too for a while. And they the first task was with every recovery team in the under the Endangered Species Act is to write a recovery plan. It was published in 1976. And a lot of times that is it. And agencies are on their own. But the recovery team for the Kirtlands uh, stayed in existence and met twice a year. And they really oversaw the recovery. And that was probably one of the reasons that the Kirtlands uh, recovered so well, because they really kept this coordinating team together. The goal of the recovery plan was a thousand pairs on a sustained basis. This is a cartoon that appeared in that recovery plan that kind of explains why to care about an endangered species. One of the things that happened is with the Endangered Species Act, and the listing of the Kirtlands, this nesting area was closed and had to be posted. The only way people could go into the Kirtlands nesting area was on tours. And that's uh, why these signs were posted and that was part of my job when I worked for the Forest Service was to post these and also to lead the tours. Also interpretive signs were put around in strategic places to help people understand the management. How is the census done currently? Well, it's done a little differently than when my dad was doing it back in 1951. 
now we have a lot more people, a lot more volunteers, and we almost always go out in twos and sometimes threes or more. And we walk in a straight line, a transect through a mile section. And these used to be a quarter mile apart. Now they're doing them every eighth of a mile if they can apart. And we use a uh, handheld GPS meter or a unit. And we stop every 200 meters in this straight line transect. And we listen for five minutes. And if we see a Kirtland's, we will write it down. But if we hear one off in the distance, we will take a compass bead and then draw a line in that direction. Then we get to the next stop, we will listen again and we'll draw another line with a compass bead to that same bird and where they cross is about where that bird would be. And we do that for the whole route and then we start off, well usually we're heading out to the area to sense it's about five o'clock in the morning. By six we're heading through the jack pine and by about 11 we're uh, coming out. That's when the most song is, is in the morning. And we get to head to a restaurant in town for a late breakfast or early lunch. And then we get with the people on either side of us and we come up with a master map. Because some of the ones in between we would have confirmed with each other and uh, we would have both had. And the ones right on our line would be ones that we probably only had. So here's uh, starting off on the census in a group of three. And this is one of my census maps. This was actually, I had three people on my route. This was my old boss, Bill Irvin and his wife, who I often census with. We were on a road this time. And the reason was this was in uh, 2003 and he had retired and had very serious arthritis and uh, it was all he could do to walk on the road. So we're on the road and here's some other routes here and this was not a complete mile section you can see this was a burn as you can see it's a regular shape and all these are the compass lines we drew and the uh, the mail symbols and the other people on the other route we used our map because they really just heard except for this one here I think could they heard all the same ones we did Cowbird problem. You heard about that on the video. Uh, Nathan Leopold was a grad student of Norman Wood. And he was the first one to suggest that this was a problem. Nathan Leopold got famous for another unfortunate reason. He and his cousin Richard Leb, uh, they were from Chicago. And again, uh, Leopold was a student at University of Michigan of Woods, but uh, I guess it was during the summer one year they decided to uh, commit the perfect crime uh, and they murdered uh, I can't remember it was Leopold's or Leb's cousin and Clarence Darrow saved them from execution. Uh, Leb I think died in prison. Nathan Leopold was eventually uh, released. I think he was in his 80s or 90s and one of the first things he wanted to do was go back and see the Kirtlands and I think I recall, I think he wound up um, being kind of a monk after that and uh, I'm trying to repent. But anyway, this is the curtain, I mean the cowbird, the female and the male. The female is kind of uniform, kind of a light tan or brown. This is a curtain's nest with one curtain's egg and two cowbird eggs. You see how much bigger they are. And a lot of times, as they said, the sometimes it, the female cover would peck the egg of the, the Kirtlands or their host or throw it out. Sometimes the young would do that. But if not, the young are just bigger and they they hatch first and they just get most of the food and they wind up living in the, the host like the Kirtlands, uh, it winds up uh, starving. Now there's some birds that have defenses against the, against the cowbird, but uh, the Kirtlands, never experienced a cowbird. The cowbird was called the buffalo bird when it was first discovered because they followed the bison around uh, eating insects and 
seeds kicked up by the bison, but if you're following the bison around, then it's going to be very hard to nest because you can't incubate your eggs. It's going to take two weeks or more and feed your young before they can fly. So they developed this habit. It was Nicholas Cuthbert that I talked about earlier that uh, also suggested cowbirds were a problem. He was ornithologist at Central Michigan University, one of two ornithologists there. And he investigated ways to control them and settled upon blackbird traps. And that's adapted from the um, farms and ranches on the, in the, uh, the Great Plains that had used those effectively. What they do is they catch cowbirds and mist nets in, in Ohio, then they bring them up and they put them in the traps to serve as decoys. And they usually put like a blue ribbon on them so they can tell the decoys. And they put a lot of food in there for them and cowbirds are very social birds and when they see a bunch of uh, their friends in here and a lot of good food here, they say, oh, it's a party. And they, it's hard to see in this trap, but there's an opening here where they can drop through. They have to fold their wings, drop through, but then they can't get back out because they have to fly, get back up and their wings are out and they can't get out. So they're caught. And this is a Detroit Audubon tour, uh, looking at a cowbird trap. This is actually a newer design than what you saw in the video. And this is, and I think it's interesting, the courtship of the cowbird. They're, I think, a fascinating bird. I always wonder how they know they're cowbirds since they're being raised by other birds. But here's uh, a male cowbird doing its courtship. It, and it says, the brink, and it bows very, uh, very deeply, almost looks like it's going to fall off the branch. And that's their, uh, their courtship display. This trapping was really important. It probably saved the Kirtlands. You heard in the video that before trapping, 70% of the nests were parasitized. And after it went down to 6%, uh, even more telling, I think, is the fledging rate. Before trapping, it was 0.51 per nest fledged, and that means they were raised to the point that the nestlings left the nest. After trapping, now you think about that, 0.51 per nest. That means half a nestling per nest. That means every two nests, there would be one young survive. That's a prescription for extinction. Not even replacing one of the adults from each pair. After the uh, trapping, the fudging rate went up to 3.56 per nest. I think it's more than that now, but it, that's a pretty good rate. Okay. But that wasn't enough. It saved the Kirtlands, but the population was stagnant. If you look at this chart, it stayed in the 200s from 1971 clear to 1991. It got up substantially towards 300 in 1990, but um, it stayed in the 200s until then. And there were some in Wisconsin, you can see here in Ontario, but they were singing males that they never found a mate, never uh, were able to confirm nesting during these years. So what happened to help the Kirtlands recover? Well, we found out there was another problem and we found out about it in an unintentional way. Uh, the way they were managing the Kirtlands at the time was with prescribed burns, but it was very hard to get the conditions right. It had to be dry enough to have a good fire, but not too dry. It had to be windy enough so that the fire had oxygen, but not too windy. And I, I was up there for one whole summer working for the Forest Service. I was supposed to get to see a controlled burn. Not, I was not trained to, to uh, be part of the controlled burn, but I was going to get to at least watch it but uh, it never happened because it was 
very, very dry summer. We hardly have any rain at all, which just too dangerous. Well, in 1980, in May, they, the Forest Service did do a control burn. They were burning a thousand acres and they had the weather conditions. They knew the wind was gonna pick up later, but they thought they had time to get the burn in, but the wind picked up too soon. And the fire was on the uh, east side of M33. It jumped M33 and burned west 26,000 acres. Several homes around Mack Lake were destroyed. It was, I don't remember, I remember I was actually working for the National Park Service at the time, I was at a training session in Beckley, West Virginia. And I was walking through the corridors and seeing these little pods where there were lounges and people watching TV and you know, about dinner time and the news was on and I saw this forest fire and said, boy, that looks like Jack Pine. And it turned out it was the very area where I used to take the tours around Mac Lake. See, there's a house that burned. And by the way, the people that had trees right up near their house are the ones that lost their houses. The one that, ones that cleared the trees more from around their houses survived. Here I am leading a tour Memorial Day weekend of that year. And here you see the older jack pine that had burned. Uh, I was given special permission since I had led tours. They allowed, they gave me a special permit to lead tours for Detroit Audubon into the Kirtlands area. And also I went up there ahead of time and they showed me some of the burn so I could uh, take them to see that as well. So we had tremendous habitat come back from that. Almost all the 26,000 acres wound up being habitat, probably save the Kirtlands. Um, unfortunately, this is that monument you saw in Miles, right by the courthouse, which has now been rebuilt. The, the courthouse burned a few years ago too, but on this monument of the Kirtlands in Mayo, you'll see this plaque to James Swiderski. He was a wildlife biologist. I knew him, had done the census with him a couple times. And he was in charge of the fire and I think that he probably took some risks that maybe he shouldn't have. And anyway, he died in that fire. He was the only person to die. He was definitely dedicated to the Kirtlands and uh, passionate about the Kirtlands, but uh, would be nice if he could have lived. Uh, and seeing the comeback himself. So here's the jack pine seedlings coming back. Uh, by the way, they left all the standing jack pines so it fell down on its own. And then there were just all these dead trees that we had to climb over. We probably were climbing up and over as much as we were going in a straight line in those first years after the burn when we were doing the census. And amazingly, just a couple years after the burn, the Kirtland's Warbler Festival started. And there were people up there that were ready to just uh, kill all the Kirtlands and be done with it. But I think the fact that the Forest Service and the DNR said, uh, we're not going to do control burns anymore for the Kirtlands. And so I think that helped pave the way for the festival. We started out in Mayo, uh, as you saw in the video. It then moved to Kirtland's Community College outside of Roscommon. And then there was a president of Kirtland's Community College, a new president that didn't think that fit with what the college should be doing. So he ended it and it was on hiatus for a few years and it now is happening in downtown Roscommon. It has been uh, rekindled and it is doing well. This is Dr. Bert Barnes. He was my forestry professor at the University of Michigan. Just a tremendous guy. And he was contracted and his graduate students to study how the habitat came back after that 1980 fire. And they looked at soil, at the, you know, soil pits and they found, you know, some places were, you know, it was sandy, but there were some clay lenses in some places that were important. They looked at ground vegetation, they looked at microclimate, all kinds of things. 
And what they were able to do is to tell managers, and Chao Ming was the chief graduate student from China, able to tell the managers what kind of area the Kirtlands first occupied. You know, which area kind of habitat characteristics were, you know, attracting the birds earliest. What characteristics kept them there the longest and which characteristics led to the most density, the highest numbers of Kirtlands in a given area. So with that, managers had the tools that they needed to mimic fire and do plantations. And so you saw this from the air. One of the things that they found is that the Kirtlands really preferred having scattered openings. So they wound up coming up with this was called the opposable wave where you have these openings here. And a lot of times they're nesting in the openings, but feeding a lot in the openings too. And the openings are where there are blueberries. And it turns out that the Kirtlands not only, most warblers are insect eaters, but the Kirtlands eats blueberries and feeds its young blueberries in addition to insects. So it might be blueberries that is one of the key characteristics of their habitat here. So after the fire uh, it took about eight to 10 years to really get good habitat and then they just started ballooning. You can see went from 265 to 347 and then jumped up to near 500, 600, 700 and also some started going to the UP and we had documented breeding up there and now we have reached 2015, 2015 was the last census. They're now going to start next year doing it every two years, but it was on hiatus for a few years. 2015, there were 2,366 singing males. Remember, the goal was 1,000, but on a sustained basis. We reached 1,000 in 2001, went over 1,000, but uh, waited 19 years to delist it. And the reason was that sustainable basis, trying to make sure that this was a long-term trend and also to make sure that there were agreements in place that management would continue because this is probably the first species delisted it is management dependent it needs management to make sure the habitat continues because we're putting out wildfires so without the habitat management it's not going to survive and then cowbird trapping was sought to be needed on an on ongoing basis too. You can see now there are some in Wisconsin as well and in Ontario. This is the, some of the Wisconsin habitat. I got to go there last summer. It's kind of late. It was in July. And some of our group that was at an Audubon, National Audubon Convention in Milwaukee did see a Kirtlands. They weren't seen but uh, this is habitat. This is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist who's uh, in charge of things there. This is on a golf course, actually, but it's a 10,000 acre golf course, and only about 200 is developed with a golf course and um, you know, uh, lodging and so forth. The rest of the area is being uh, restored to its natural ecological condition. And by the way, uh, this is the area where Elder Leopold, if you know him, famous conservation wrote, conservationist wrote a San County Almanac. And they give a copy of that book to everybody that comes up there and stays with them. Hey, Jim, I just want to give you a time check. We're about 20 minutes to 8 o'clock. So just want okay. to let you know. All right. Um, this is in the UP, this is UP habitat, Upper Peninsula, and this is Eric Carey, who's on the recovery team. He's the Bahamian representative. And this shows you the plantations, which means planted, I said I've got an N here, um, planted areas in the here in National Forest, over 90% of them are in plantations. There's 70 to 80% in overall implantations. Why not 100%? Well, there still are fires that happen, and those fires, before they get them put out, 
uh, while a lot of times still create some habitat. And this gives you a graphic representation of the success of Pertland's warbler management. All right, what are some other species that benefit from Kirtland's warbler management? You saw some of them, but I'm going to give you a few others. Uh, the blackback woodpecker. After a fire, this is the first one, first bird probably to come back. They like the burned, fresh burned jack pine. That's where they nest. They uh, make their nest cavities in the burned jack pine. But they're only going to be there for two, three, maybe four years at the most, and then they're gone and looking for a fresh burn. This is one of the birds that uh, is not going to really benefit from the current management. Uh, some wildfires uh, are the only places where they're going to wind up. Uh, up on Sandpiper, they talked about in the film. Eastern bluebirds. Bluebirds are very common in the Kirtlands area. They use the dead trees to make their nest using old woodpecker nests. Probably a lot of them are old blackback woodpecker nests. But some of them could be old flicker nests. And they will stay on through most of the, the uh, duration of the time they're used by the Kirtlands, unlike the blackback woodpecker. Clay-colored sparrows, kind of a, a rare sparrow of grasslands primarily, but here they're in the low jack pine, and they have a almost insect-like call, just kind of buzz, buzz. So we often have seen those on uh, Audubon field trips to the Kirtlands area. The prairie warbler used to be more common in the jack pine plains. I haven't seen one in years, but every year you know, maybe one or two people see one. Uh, their biggest enclave in Michigan is now in the little bit of jack pine that's in the sand dunes along Lake Michigan. And we talked about blueberry and the Kirtlands feeding blueberry to their young. And they also a lot of times like to hide their nest. The few nests that I've seen have been hidden in blueberry, blueberry clumps. It's called an Alexander. Cory Pacoon, which is just really prevalent, and Frostweed, which is, um, I really like the fact that they've got these stamens with the uh, orange anthers with the pollen laying flat inside the flower. It's called Frostweed because it's sensitive to frost. And Sweet Fern, well, you step on that, uh, it just you know, is aromatic, just a beautiful smell. And I never made a tea fern, but I understand you can make a tea from it. And I guess even sell sweet fern tea. It's a low shrub, kind of like blueberry. Allegheny plum, which was mentioned, Pennsylvania sedge. This is one of the key materials that the Kirtland uses to make its nest. Uh, it looks a lot like a grass, but it's got a triangular stem. And they talked about white-tailed deer, wild turkey, and badgers, like the open sand plains. Vesper sparrows, which are a grassland bird, but the, uh, the pioneer stages of the jack pine have low vegetation and they uh, find it to their liking. And I put this blurry picture in because it shows the key characteristic of the Vesper sparrow, the two outer white tail feathers. Its song sounds a lot like a song sparrows to me, but it starts out with a couple uh, flute-like whistles. 13 line ground squirrels common up there. Hermit thrush you should have seen in the video singing. I don't think they showed its uh, kind of reddish brown tail. Oven birds. Uh, these are in the older jack pine but you can often hear them like when you're doing the census uh, in the newer jack pine because their song is so loud. Brown thrashers are very common. Sometimes it's hard to hear the Kirtlands because these brown thrashers are so loud. Um, not very common in a lot of other places anymore, but they really do well on the jack pine and black bears as well, probably feeding on the blueberries. And there are not a lot of snakes here, but the hognose snake is found here. 
and actually found this one last summer in the Kirtlands area. They're named for their upturned snout here. They're completely harmless. They don't have any venom. They never bite. I don't think they know what that means, but they will put on a show for you. They flatten their head like a cobra, and you'll see in this video uh, putting on quite a scary show, but it's all bluff. They'll even strike but with their mouth closed. They don't bite. The way it's smelling when he's sticking his tongue out. Well, if that doesn't work, they'll roll over on their backs and play dead with their mouth open. But the, the comical thing is if you realize that and you turn them back on their belly, they'll turn right back over on their back again and say, oh no, I'm dead. The reason we think they do this is that a lot of predators want to kill their prey. That way they get fresh prey. They're not going to eat something already dead. You saw the northern flicker on the video and the Nashville warbler. Hardly ever see that red top knot, but it's shown in this picture. And then uh, one they didn't show that is common in some areas in the, of the jack pine where the Kirtland's nest and not so common very many other places. And that's the Brewer's Blackbird with its uh, yellow eye. It almost looks like a uh, small version of a grackle. has a much shorter tail. And they nest and seem to congregate in groups. In older jack pine, we get the uh, yellow rumped warbler, something called the myrtle warbler, the pine warbler, and occasionally we'll get spruce grouse, which are much more common up north. But occasionally they have shown up in older jack pine, formerly occupied by Kirtlands. Here, showing the Bahamas where they winter and also some now in Cuba. Well, I went down to the Bahamas uh, with the recovery team. There was one found on Andros Island and we went to Andros to look for it, but it was not where it had been anymore. So that was un unfortunate, but uh, about a week later, as we got back to Detroit, or wherever we came from, family. about a week later, we got word that an ornithology class had visited Eleuthera Island, another island, and they found 11 Kirtlands. Well, the research that was about to begin on the Kirtlands in the Bahamas was going to be on Andros, but they moved it to Eleuthera. And there was one that was actually found on uh, the governor's harbor. So they called him the governor, and he was there, I don't know, 10, 11 years. And they actually found him up on the breeding grounds as well, this bird nicknamed the governor. Here's a biologist that's being trained in the Bahamas. That was one of the things that Dave Ewart got started. And Phil Huber with the Forest Service is uh, getting funding to train people to manage Kirtland's Warbler down in the Bahamas. Uh, Jay, uh, excuse me, uh, Lino, uh, who was the very first person, he actually talked at one of our Detroit Audubon annual conferences about three years ago, I think. Uh, they had been looking for the Kirtlands in the Pine Islands. Mayfield spent 10 winters down there, parts of 10 winters, never found the Kirtlands. But he was always looking in the pines, and it turns out that's not what they like down in the Bahamas. They want a little change of pace and they are in deciduous shrubs 
and particularly goat farms. Sometimes very thick vegetation. This doesn't really do it justice because sometimes it's very hard to find them because they're not singing. And they feed on berries primarily, not insects. Berries, including the silverberry, which this is, and there are two others which I don't remember the names of. So it's very important that uh, we learn more about the wintering area and protect this wintering habitat. And we need to know more about its migratory stopovers and its migration as well. I was able to uh, observe a Kirtlands in Michigan City, Indiana when I was working for the National Park Service at Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. This Kirtlands was for two days on a little spit of sand by the marina in Michigan City, Indiana. So I got, I wrote a paper about this and cataloged its behavior. And that's one thing I would suggest to people. If you are watching birds and uh, you track the birds that you see, one of the things that is really good to do is note their behavior. Because I went through the records of stream migration and a lot of people didn't even tell whether it was singing, whether it was a male, what kind of vegetation it was in, all those kind of things could be very helpful. I knew, I was just sure for a long time that we were going to find Kirtlands migrating in the Detroit area and finally, there are a lot in Ann Arbor, I think a lot of it was because of Norman Wood being out looking for them and others, but the first one was found in Detroit on May 21st, 2017. I had been birding on Belle Isle that day but it was a lot of intermittent rain and did not see it. Um, here's another picture of the one on Belle Isle. But this was just two days before Detroit was declared an urban bird treaty city at a ceremony down uh, on the riverfront by Millican State Park. And it was able to tell people that we now can say that Detroit is a stopover for the Kirtlands, at least sometimes. And this is Nathan Cooper I talked to you about at the Smithsonian. He's doing the cutting edge research now. Here he's taking the Kirtlands out of a mist net. But he's studying them in the Bahamas and in Michigan and also studying migration. And one of the ways he's studying migration is by putting uh, radio transmitters on them, geolocated as they call them, or nanotags. Uh, he also is taking blood and feathers and analyzing those and they have an isotope footprint in them and they know when those feathers are grown and they're able to actually use those isotopes to actually help figure out where they are wintering and even where they're, uh, they are in the, the summer sometimes. As, Different islands will have different isotope signatures, for instance. So here's attaching nanotags and geolocators. Now the geolocators, they have to recapture the bird to take the locator off and then uh, download the data. And what that is recording is in the areas where they are is the uh, sunset and sunrise and the amount of daylight and based on that, they can get their location. And with that, he's able was able to really give us a more precise look at their migration. Nanotags, on the other hand, are just antennas that extend back off their tail. They're lighter, and you don't need to recapture them to get the data. The data is taken every time they go by on one of these MODIS towers. Uh, there are several, by the way, out in our Black Turn Research Area in Lake St. Clair. Now, these are all operated by Bird Studies Canada, and you have to get the, the data from them um, at the end of the season and analyze it. I'm going to, uh, well, I guess I'm going to try going to this. I had this all queued up, but... Um, This is uh, the Smithsonian website about the Kirtland study. You can read more about it. But I'm going to go down over here to show you this map. It's an animated map. You'll need to switch screens. Oh, 
Thanks. Sarah, keep me on my toes. Yeah, put it back here. Okay. And we go back to the PowerPoint. Another study that Nathan Cooper is doing is based on is the, regarding the cowbird. In Recent years, they haven't been getting very many in the traps. So he decided to take a look at this more closely and they decided to stop trapping. And I think this is the fourth year they haven't trapped. And they've been doing instead extensive research, you know, finding nests and looking to see whether there's parasitism and they found none. So it may be that over these many years that the cowbird was being trapped in this area, that the cowbirds adapted and uh, has figured out not to even try to breed in this area because it wasn't being successful. Um, so they're going to keep doing this and the trapping has been the hardest thing to try to fund. It's just not uh, as, you know, something that, that people want to fund like habitat um, but you know that we will trap if we need to but they're going to keep doing these nest surveys and trapping will be reinstituted if they find parasitism again but uh, until then uh, we don't probably need to trap they're keeping the the traps uh, you know maintained so if they ever need to use them again that they can quickly um, reinstitute that trapping. They are continuing trapping in the Upper Peninsula where, you know, it's much newer habitat and much less uh, time occupying it. So the cowbirds probably want to learn to avoid that and they're trapping cowbirds in Wisconsin too. In 2017, the Kirtland's Water Recovery Team was replaced by the Kirtland's Water Conservation Team. Some of the same members, some not. Um, there's a different objective now. It's to sustain the population, not to recover it. So it's, there's a curtains over conservation plan and there's also a business plan because now there's no endangered species money. They have to find out, you know, where this money is coming from. Some will come from agencies, but uh, some of it's going to have to be raised. So the Kirtland's Warbler was delisted, taken off the endangered species list, November 8th, 2019. It was announced at a ceremony that I attended at the Kellogg Center in East Lansing at Michigan State University on October 8th, 2019. They have to announce it um, 30 days before they actually make it final. So this was the announcement and then it was made final, but they have to give a time for comments and so forth, and and then they make a final determination. This is Bill Rapai, the author of that latest book on the Kirtlands and now executive director of the Kirtlands Wolver Alliance speaking at that ceremony. And here's Michigan DNR director Dan Eichinger speaking at that ceremony. And this is my old boss, Bill Irvin, who did a tremendous lot to bring back the Kirtlands. He ran the census for years. Even after he retired from the Forest Service, he was hired as a consultant to uh, continue the census for years. Um, and this is his wife, Joan, who I, she always did the census for years. And we often were uh, 
partners on census routes. Well, she came back for the ceremony, so it was good to see her. We lost Bill a couple years ago. Uh, and this is me, uh, my Kirtland's Warbler lapel pin, and my Kirtland's Warbler tie, which I'm wearing again right now, with mostly pictures that I took and also one that Sharon Cordy took. The Kirtland's Warbler Alliance is the group that I was appointed to. It's we started out thinking we we're going to be friends of the Kirtland Warbler, but we thought this was a little stronger sounding. Um, we were created, we're our own nonprofit now, to raise awareness about the Kirtlands and support for the Kirtlands post delisting. Um, so we take legislators out to see the Kirtlands, and we do programs on the Kirtlands, and we serve as probably. Uh, the central source for information on the Kirtlands. And uh, we also help to raise money for the Kirtlands. So uh, if you want to help the Kirtlands, uh, you might want to go to that website. This is, you can uh, make donations to the Kirtlands Warbler Alliance. Uh, this is actually partly started by Detroit Audubon. And uh, also this is a good source. If you want to go out and see a Kirtlands, this will tell you how you can find a tour and uh, how to enjoy this beautiful species that is our comeback Michigan bird, which some of us think still should be our state bird. So, vive l'oiseau de fer, long live the bird of fire. That is my Kirtland's Warbler talk. So I'd be glad to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Jim. We had um, one question from Barbara. She asked what happens to the cowbird after they're trapped? Usually don't <laughs> talk about that unless asked, but they are humanely dispatched, I guess is the, the way to put it. I guess at the start they did try releasing them elsewhere, but uh, they wound up coming right back and getting caught in the trap again, so that wasn't working. All right. And their populations are, you know, not in any danger. They are uh, lots of cowbirds. If you have feeders, you probably see them at your feeders in spring and fall. True. Um, we had someone ask, Pamela said, I did a tour some years ago. They said that there was a hundred year plan for their recovery. Does that still exist? A hundred year plan. They're, the recovery plan has been accomplished and so now there's a conservation plan. I can tell you with the jack pine, I think they're doing some on a shorter basis, but for the most part, they're, the jack pine's on what's called a 50 year rotation so that they let them grow to 50 years old. The older trees are gonna be much more uh, merchantable. They're not really um, great for lumber. They're mostly used for pulp wood uh, and particle board. But also if you keep them going that long, then they're going to provide habitat for the, the yellow rumped warblers and the pine warblers and maybe spruce grouse. And so you get the whole continuum of you know, pioneer stage to, uh, you know, the, the older stages. But I understand that I think there's some areas where they are cutting some of them earlier uh, to, to try to provide habitat sooner. Great. Um, we had a question from Christine asking if there are Kirtland warblers near Port Crescent. Port Crescent, that's in the thumb, right? Is that mm, right? I would have to look it up. I think so. uh, they might go through a migration, but uh, I don't believe that they wouldn't be nesting there. Yeah, it's near Port Austin. Yeah, yeah. I went up to that area to look to Sleeper State Park for mm -hmm. comet watching. So. I know that area. No, they wouldn't be in the, the thumb. They might migrate through there, but they are 
more in the north central part of Michigan, Mayo, Roscommon, Gray Lane, up to uh, Oscoda, um, current Pine River area. Um, she mentioned she thought there were jack pine there, so I guess that's a question: is is if if there are jack pine, will there definitely there won't definitely be Kirtland warblers then? Well, there are jack pine like on Lake Michigan too in the dunes, but they're just not extensive enough areas, and I expect that's the case in the thumb. Not to say that that couldn't be, but I think that's also a little south of you know, where they normally would. That's what you heard in the video that they need at least 80 acres of jack pine and a thousand or more is better. So I know like Indiana Dunes where I uh, used to work, we had prairie warblers there in the jack pine, but it was, you know, probably the jack pine areas were like an acre, two acres or three acres of, or less. That would not be nearly enough for the Kirtlands. Okay, I think that was all. There was a question earlier, but he's not here anymore about some of the books that you had mentioned, whether they were still available. And someone did post the link for the digitized copy. Uh, Gilbert Pye's book is still available, I know. The other is probably you'd have to find used, I would guess. So I can, I'll send an email out to everybody with oh, the PowerPoint and... Yeah, oh, the, no, the children's book um, is still available. Okay. Or service sells that. But the other two, the Mayfield book, which is 1960, and the Walkinshaw book, which is in the 80s, I think those are out of print, but you can find them maybe on eBay or mm -hmm. all now. Well, great. I think that's it. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, Oh, someone did say there's used copies on Amazon and Bill Rapai is planning on an updated version of his book to be published this spring, apparently. Oh. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude a list of the books in our yeah, right. email uh, along with the, the presentation and uh, recording. Um, so thank you I, so I, much. I don't know whether, yeah, how soon he'll get done, but I have started one myself. But I um, don't know. <laughs> Getting time to, to finish it is the, <laughs> the, the key for me. <laughs> well, we'll look for it. Oh, one more question. If they've ever nested near Atlanta, Michigan, if you know. Uh, that one is a little more possible. Uh, probably not. There's probably some not on the east side in the Pine River area. Probably not, are not that far from Atlanta. Michigan. Sometimes they're right there in Atlanta, but not far from Atlanta. Well, thank you everyone for coming. We really appreciate you coming out and hopefully you can join us again. We have a um, native plant webinar coming up later in August and hopefully in September, uh, one about chimney swifts and one about the hawk migration with the uh, Huron Clinton Metro Park interpreters. Um, so we'll keep these coming and please keep joining us and look on our website or emails for the next ones coming up and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, enjoyed presenting. <laughs>